through conversation with heat and fluid flow. So last time we have seen how to solve the Navier um, Stokes equations for steady flow. Today we want to look at the, the basics of turbulence modeling. Before starting, I would like to show you uh, some videos, two videos actually. And the first one is from the Center of Turbulence Research. And uh, So, and so that is at Stanford University, in collaboration with NASA Ames. Um, they have been doing so-called direct numerical simulation of turbulent flow. So that they are resolving all the scales to the smallest eddies that are needed to be resolved. And then they can follow and, uh, the turbulent flow. And I want to show you an example from turbulent boundary. So you see this now. So you see the number of grid points. That's one billion grid points. So you need a very fine resolution. And here we are following the flow. Reynolds Tau 500. That is based on the U Tau, the, uh, the friction velocity. So and you see the eddy structure. You see all the vortices and the so-called Q criterion is uh, visualized with a flow velocity u, so it's color for the flow velocity. So there you see the structure that is going on in the turbulent boundary layer. So it's fully 3D, it's unsteady, and a lot of vortices are there flowing around. And this gets uh, more and more complicated and complex as we proceed in, as we follow down this flow downstream. So that is uh, very demanding. Uh, simulation and that might take months or maybe a year and the doing visualization takes also a lot of time but the advantage is you get all the details so it cannot always be done so therefore we have to do some turbulence modeling but uh, before coming to that I want to show you another example of uh, a direct American simulation and that is from a golf ball Here. So that is from the Arizona State University. I think that people who made the visualization and Balaras and his team made the, the simulation. Again, solving the incompressible Navier Stokes equations with 1.2 billion grid points. Again, here this Q criterion to visualize the, uh, the uh, vortices is shown and uh, colored with, I think, the span by its vorticity. And you see here the dimples on the golf ball, and you see the turbulent structures that are evolving in the flow. So this is uh, interesting in itself from a fundamental point of view, but also for the companies who produce golf balls, so they are also interested in that. Here we have a slice, and there we see the vorticity in the span wise direction. So we have the separation, at, uh, at, the, when, at the end of the dimples, and then we might have also vortex interaction with the next dimple. So um, these details can all be studied by doing this direct numerical simulation. And here, I think it's the vorticity, the, the modulus of the vorticity, that is, uh, we have contour lines of that. So you see different ways how to visualize the turbulent structure. So that shows uh, the complexity of the flow. You know why the people do the golf ball dimpled? It gets turbulent and then the drag is lower, so then it can fly longer. So you know that the flow is mechanics. So but these details, that they are special for the um, American simulation. Okay, so that shows you the complexity of the turbulent mm -hmm. flow. That is from uh, the Center of Governance Research. This well, turbulent, as you can see, in, could see in these examples, we have now the opportunity to do numerical simulations of that, get all the details, but it's extremely costly in terms of computational power. We have now also uh, increasing, um, improved 
experimental techniques, for example, particle image velocimetry, that we can also follow turbulent structures. But it's still very difficult. And so, um, and actually, the basic understanding of turbulence is still lacking. So it's still true what uh, uh, the saying of the Nobel laureate physicist, German physicist Werner Heisenberg, he was uh, asked, um, given the opportunity uh, to meet God, what would he ask? And uh, he answered, when I meet God, I'm going to ask him two questions. Why relativity and why turbulence? I really believe he will have an answer for the first. So not for turbulence. <laughs> So a similar saying is uh, from uh, the British um, mathematician and physicist Horace Lamb, but uh, I think his first option was quantum mechanics. But still, uh, turbulence is an open question. So we want now to see how we can solve that, not doing these extremely expensive simulations, but still getting reasonable answers. And that brings us into turbulence modeling. So, when the flow, um, well, first we look at the, the basics. And the important parameter that we have to consider is the Reynolds number. So the Reynolds number, that is here the decisive parameter. And that was found by Osborn Reynolds in his famous uh, dye experiment. And that is if we have a length scale capital L, if we have, um, for example, the uh, golf ball, for example, the diameter of the golf ball, we could take as a characteristic length scale. Then we have, the, say in our case, the density is constant, but otherwise we would have a reference density. We would have a reference velocity, for example, the incoming flow velocity that is uniform, and then times the length scale divided by the viscosity. So that is the Reynolds number, you know that. If that is high enough, the, turb the flow transitions from laminar to turbulent flow. That is a very complex process in itself. Now we want to look at uh, try to characterize this, and we do that by the so-called energy spectrum. The energy spectrum for turbulent flow. So we are going to um, draw here a graph. I draw it and then I give the explanation for the, uh, what the axis means. So we have here the wave number that is denoted here by kappa. The wave number. And on this scale here um, we have the energy spectral density. So that is E of kappa, the energy spectral density. So now what, what are these uh, expressions? Um, first, the energy spectral density. We have the turbulent kinetic energy unit mass and that is the K. So that is defined as one half of the turbulent kinetic energy. We have fluctuations of the flow with respect to a mean and we have a product of that and then we take a time average of that. We'll come back to that later. So we do that for the velocity components in all three directions. So that is supposed to be the turbulent kinetic energy. 
And then we do a Fourier transform of that so that we can express it as an integral. So we can say that the k is an integral from 0 to infinity where we decompose that in its contributions with respect to the wave number, kappa. So then we do that. What it means is that we try to extract for which wave numbers, the long waves or the short waves, who contain most of the energy, the turbulent kinetic energy. So then we can characterize uh, the turbulent flow by this. And that here is the, the, the uh, spectral, energy spectral density. So that is the energy spectral density. And then we draw this figure here and try to see where, in which, for which wave numbers, which, which contain the most um, of the energy. And we have now a log scale here, a log log scale, so it's logarithmic on the uh, abscissa and ordinate. And we start here roughly at L to minus 1, inverse of the characteristic length scale, and we get down at the end to something that is called eta to the minus one. And this eta, that is the Kolmogorov length scale. So, so the eta that is defined as the kinematic viscosity mu to the power three divided by the dissipation rate to the power one over four. So nu first is the, that is the ratio of the viscosity and the density, so it's the kinematic viscosity. And the epsilon is the dissipation rate. That is the dissipation rate. We'll come back to that later, per unit mass. So the units of this are the unit of eta. Uh, let's see. That is sorry. Sorry. Yeah. That uh, yeah. That was the Kolmogorov length scale and the kinematic viscosity and the epsilon. Here the unit of that is meter squared per second. So if we write that, let's see. So the unit of mu is meter squared per seconds in SI units, and the unit of the dissipation rate, epsilon, is uh, meter squared per second to the power 3. So we'll come back to this epsilon later. But this is the smallest epsilon, the Kolmogorov length scale, let me see, I think I didn't write it, the Kolmogorov length scale, that is the smallest length scale that we can have. Let me see. So that is the eta. Okay, so then we look at now at this figure, how it uh, looks like. And then it turns out that roughly we have something of the following kind. We have some, some increase in the energy and then it flattens and then we have some certain, a certain slope here which is constant. And then it, in the end it, it drops, let's see, it drops a little bit beyond the, uh, the eta minus one, something like that. So the interesting thing is, and that is something that you can check later, that one can check, that this slope that you can have here in this part, so that is for, say, medium and small um, um, wavelengths or medium and large wave numbers, that this slope here, that the E of kappa here is proportional <coughs> to the kappa to the power minus 5 third. So that is something that one can find out in this region. 
And now, when we do the simulation of uh, turbulent flow, for direct numerical simulation, we try to capture all the scales, so that we capture also the scales up to the Kolmogorov length scale. Then we get all the details. That is what we saw in the examples from the boundary layer, turbulent boundary layer, and from the golf ball. There, the, net, the grid was so fine that it was uh, maybe a fraction then of the Kolmogorov length scale. But usually we cannot do that, it's too costly, and then we do something in the range that is roughly here. So it's um, in the range for, say, the, the low wave numbers, so the long waves with the, with the large wavelength and the small wave numbers. And in this region here, we do something that we are going to do that is called LUTS, Reynolds Average Navier-Stokes Equation. That is the most common turbulence modeling approach. So the runs. That is Reynolds average. Navier Stokes. And in there, we compute the mean uh, velocity and mean pressure. So the mean, that is in our case, in that case, is the time average. So we'll come to that later, but I already give the, the, the symbol is the bar. That is meaning time average. So it's u, and that is then, let's say, u, v, w, the whole vector. And the pressure. They are all computed. And then we get additional terms. We get terms of the kind u prime, u prime, and uh, say, and if these are vectors, then so that is a tensor, and we get an average over that. They, these are the, uh, as we shall see, related to the Reynolds stresses, and these terms are more. So that is the approach, the most common one, the Reynolds Average Navi Stokes equation. So then, over the say, last 10, 20 years, or even longer, in, actually in weather forecast, people have extended that and, uh, into the range where we have this behavior of the energy spectral density, so roughly around here. And in this range here, that is up to a certain limit of the resolution of our grid, the wave numbers that we can resolve up to then, one can do large eddy simulation, LES. That is a very current field of research. And actually, at the moment, people are trying to do some combinations of, of these two. So that is large eddy simulation. And in large eddy simulation, the large eddies are resolved. You saw a lot of eddies now in the animations. And in that case, we had even a DNS, so they were resolved anyway. But in large eddy simulation, not all eddies are resolved. The small eddies are modeled. And what we do here is not a time average, it's a spatial average that is done here. It's also a, a different from the runs approach. So the small eddies are modeled. So here the modeling effort is less because it is only then these the part that is here that is not resolved that has to be modeled. The rest is resolved by the numerical simulation by the solution of the Navier-Stokes equations. And then, if we do the whole scale, then we can do a DNS. So if we have the whole scale here from the very beginning to the very end, 
So then we have we can do DNS. That was the example that we saw. So then we can resolve all scales. DNS direct numerical simulation. And in there, all relevant scales. Are and that's why we need such a fine, such fine grids to be able to do that, because we get very small eddies, and we get them over a large, scale, uh, large uh, variety. So we get big eddies, small, small, and smaller. So that is then um, the requirement to get a fine grid, <coughs> and they are resolved up to the. Uh, Kolmogorov microscale. <coughs> so all that is resolved. So we continue on that. So I continue now. So that simulation, simulation, all relevant scales resolved up to the Kolmogorov microscale. Describing the smallest permanent eddies. So we we have the following relation. So that for the Kolmogorov microscale eta, we can derive the relation to the characteristic length scale of our problem. And it turns out that that is proportional to the Reynolds number based on this characteristic length scale of our problem to the power minus 3, 4. So then you can, uh, you have the length scale, you know the Reynolds number, then you can estimate the Kolmogorov length scale. And then, if we want to resolve, that is what we do in DNS, up to these scales, turbulent flow, We want to do that in a cube, say L to the power 3. So that would be our characteristic length and that would be our dimension that we want, that we want to compute it. So that would require, requires at least, we have then this uh, relation here, then we require that many points in the, uh, uh, the, the inverse of that will be the number of points that we require to resolve in one direction. So that will be then L over eta. So if we want to resolve that, if we have a length scale L, then that will be the, the number of uh, grid points in one dimension, but we have three dimensions, so that will be to the power three. So that is then proportional to the Reynolds number based on the characteristic length L to the power, this is then to the power 3, that is then 9 fourths. Nine four. So that means that will be the number of read points that is required. And then you can imagine that we need quite many if we have large Reynolds numbers and it goes with more than the power of two. And we imagine that we have also to do a time discretization, we get another uh, requirement on that, also regarding the time steps. But now just looking at the grid points, we have this relationship. Imagine if we have the uh, Airbus A380, or we have a large ship, we have the Reynolds number 10 to the eight. 10 to the eight, so that means we have a requirement of Reynolds to the power 18 grid points. At the moment, we can do, as you saw, 10 to the 9, 1 billion grid points or more, but this is 1 billion times larger. 
So we, it will need some time to do that. So, but I expect that you will experience that because computing power is expanding so much. Every one and a half year, roughly, it's doubling. So that's Moore's law. So we will see it, but it will take some time. At the moment, we couldn't do it. We can only do it what you saw were small radius numbers, relatively small radius numbers. Okay, so then we, instead of then doing uh, DNS or LES, I would re recommend you to follow a course of my colleague Helga Anderson on these topics, on turbulence and turbulence modeling. We shall now focus on, on this here, on Reynolds average, average Navier Stokes equations and try to understand that. And then we shall see that is indeed possible for us to do with the knowledge we have now. So that is then number two. The Reynolds average Navier Stokes equations. constant density. And then we do the ansatz by Reynolds. That is, we and we do that for the flow variables and for the pressure. For example, for the velocity component in x direction, that is u, that is a function of the vector x and the time t. And then we express that as a time average or a mean, that is what we denote by this here. It might still be dependent on time plus a fluctuation prime that is definitely depending on uh, x and t. So that is the time average or mean and this is the fluctuation. So we have some average and then we have around that some fluctuation. So we'll look at that in a moment. And we do that also for the other velocity components, V and W, and also for the pressure. Now we want to define this time average. And the time average that is the following, that is the u bar, <coughs> location x and time t. So we can do it in the following way that we say we have, uh, we start from the time t and go to t plus some um, time increment delta further. So some delta t if you would like. And then we divide by this delta that we go further in time, and then we average simply the velocity, that is then the true velocity, over time. And we have a certain, sorry here I have an error, because here we have, uh, have to use different, uh, this is the variable, the t is here, and here we have to integrate them over, over time. So that is then and the definition of the time average. And the delta here, that has to fulfill certain requirement. And the requirement is the following. It should be larger than the turbulent length scale, the turbulent time scale, T1, and smaller than the time scale of the unsteady 
a mean flow. So let me see, let me see what D1, so that you could say is the maximum turbulent time scale. So we have a lot of fluctuations going on, and they should be uh, taken out, should be averaged, but it should still be such that we get if the mean is. Um, has a certain time variation that we get that. So that this, this is the minimum mean time scale. <coughs> so what is meant by that is the following. So imagine we are looking now at the flow and we look at some point x in the flow and we record then the uh, velocity over time. So here we have the time and here we record the velocity, say in the x direction, at some point x which is fixed and at the time t. So imagine we have turbulent flow, for example the boundary layer of our wind tunnel, put in um, hot wire, well, we have a PIV that we can do it, and then we record the velocity at that point, all the fluctuations. And what we might observe is the following, that we might observe something, so we start here, so that would be then our, say, our T, where we start from, and um, then we might observe something of the following. Something like that. So these are the turbulent fluctuations, and uh, say the, the difference that we have here between some two crests or um, valleys that could be identified that as the T1. So that is the, if we average over that, we should get rid of the turbulent fluctuations. But you see here, I did it in such a way that there is some something else behind it. If we do the mean here, we might get something that is looking like a sine or a cosine, so a trigonometric behavior for the mean. So the mean then, if we take that from, for example, from here to, let's see, uh, where are we here? So we go down, um, let's see, we have one, so we start here. And we get, say, roughly here, is that right? So we get here. So then we have here, say, uh, we have here uh, something like that. And that should then repeat itself. So we have a periodic mean flow here. So then we could identify then this time, this time uh, um, interval as the T. So that would be then our <coughs> mean time scale for the periodic motion of the mean. So then our averaging has the interval has to be in between, so that we get rid of these turbulent fluctuations, but at the same time that we recover the behavior in time of the mean flow. So that is the requirement that we have here. So for the and that is if we have a time-dependent mean. If we have a steady mean, then we can do it easy, more easily, then it is just dependent on x. And then this is corresponding then to the limit that we let delta going to infinity, that we do an averaging over, say, from t to uh, t plus delta. So then we can do a long time averaging and get rid of all um, time dependence. So that is what we, we shall have in our example that we shall do in exercise 12. We shall have a study. So then we use this ansatz by Reynolds for the velocity components for the pressure and we put that into the Navier-Stokes equations. So, the 
Ansatz 1 that we have here. And we do that for the whole velocity vector. Here it was just for the x component, but for dw similar and for the, and for the pressure t that is inserted into the incompressible Navier-Stokes process. And then time averaging is applied. When we do that, we shall use something. Let's see. So when we do this operation, when we do the time averaging, then we shall use the following. If we have a mean u and that is time dependent. And if we average that once more, then we get this here, that is then the 1 over delta, the, the integral from t plus t plus delta. And then we average the u bar of x tau d tau. And then we make the assumption that, okay, in this uh, short interval, this will not vary uh, essentially from the value that we have here at t. So that we can say this here is essentially equal to the u bar of x and t. So where we start, of course we have chosen this uh, uh, t, this delta, so that we get rid of the terminal fluctuations and that this is essentially constant then for this time interval. So that is for t smaller equal than uh, tau smaller equal than t plus delta. And then we can see when we have this, then we get here that this is u bar of x t. So that means the, the, if we have the averaging applied to the mean, that we get that back the mean. So that is here. So that is, that is used. If we have this property, that the mean of the mean is the mean, then we can also do the averaging here of this, of the basic Reynolds ansatz. We have the mean here, the mean here, that is then equal to the mean. Then the mean of the average, of the, the mean of the fluctuation must be zero. So that is the, 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 the consequence of that. So we write that. So from this property together with the uh, Reynolds uh, ansatz doing the averaging <coughs> I just explained, we get then um, equation four which is then the time average of the mean which is zero. So, and if we do this for the continuity equation, then we know we have the continuity equation is that the divergence of the velocity vector u is equal to zero. And now we can uh, plug in our ansatz from by Reynolds and do the um, do the time averaging. So we have at least I put now the zero on the left, and then we have this is equal to the divergence, and then we set in we put in the u bar plus the u prime. So here the answer is 1 is used, nothing more. And then we can do the 
the time averaging on that. And then the time averaging is as we see an integral. So here we have a, a divergence and an integral. We can interchange them. So that is, uh, instead of having the integral over the divergence, that is equal to the divergence over the integral. So that is uh, what we use here, so that we can that we simply can take the divergence out and do the averaging on the on u bar plus u prime. Now we do the averaging that. That is a sum. Averaging is the integral, so we can take that each summand, average each summand. And then we see that this here is according to 3, that is the u that is equal to the divergence of the average. Here I forgot the, the vectors, underscore, underscore, here and here. So once more, this here is equal to the average because of quantity 3. The mean of the mean is the mean. And this, the mean of the fluctuation is zero. So we get this. So in the end, we get the Reynolds average Navier's Stokes equation form for the continuity equation is then the divergence of the mean velocity is equal to zero. So that is then equation five. So that is the Reynolds average Navier's Stokes equation form that is of the continuity equation. So here you see then the derivation. We use the ansatz as it is described on the left uh, blackboard. We insert the Reynolds average, um, the Reynolds uh, ansatz into the, in that case, the continuity equation. That is what we did here for u. Min, uh, min, mean plus fluctuation, we do the time averaging and we find out in this case that we get that the divergence of the mean velocity is zero. So we get the same form as for the original continuity equation. Before we go into the break, I have um, one reminder, important reminder and one question. The reminder is to get access to the exam, you should be approved of 9 out of 12 exercises by November 17. So please make sure that you have enough exercises approved by that date. Of course, I have to give the people, the name of the people who get access to the exam the day after that. That is number one. Number two is a question, and that is who of you has already accepted? the invitation for the free student license for STAR CCM Plus. Okay, thank you. And uh, because I have to tell our system manager how many uh, licenses should be installed in Notre Dame. Remember, on Monday we'll have the introduction at uh, 18.15 in computer room Notre Dame, which is uh, south uh, of the Realfac uh, building. Okay, that's it. So we take a break now.